Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this listening area who are indeed glad to have this opportunity to present to you some of the leaders from our nation's capital. Today, our special guests, we have United States Senator George McGovern from the state of South Dakota, Congressman W.R. Pogue from the state of Texas. Congressman Pogue is the new chairman of the House of Representatives Committee on Agriculture. Senator McGovern, a former Food for Peace director, is a widely known member of the Senate Agricultural Committee. To open the program, here is Senator McGovern. Well, Congressman uh, Pogue, it's a pleasure having uh, served with you on the uh, House Agricultural uh, Committee a few years ago uh, to share this uh, program uh, with you today. I know there are a good many people who have followed your efforts on behalf of agriculture over the years uh, that are mighty pleased to see you in a position now as chairman of the uh, House Agricultural uh, Committee where you can uh, provide even greater uh, leadership than you have in the past. I was talking with uh, Senator Ellender uh, the other day about American uh, agriculture and about the role of uh, agriculture in our national life. He said that when he first came here to the uh, Congress back in 1937, some 30 years ago, that the uh, Agricultural Committee was the most desirable committee for members to get on in the, in the Congress, with the possible exception of the, of the Appropriations Committee. But there was a great uh, competition among congressmen and among senators to get on those uh, uh, agricultural uh, committees. Whereas today, the, uh, for various reasons, uh, uh, we sometimes have to persuade members of Congress to go on that uh, committee. And yet it's been my uh, uh, feeling that agriculture continues uh, to be a mighty important part of our total uh, American economy. And I, I wonder if you'd uh, want to comment on that general thing. Well, I am interested in Senator Ellender's statement, so I came here the same day he did. And uh, I well remember that I couldn't get on the Agricultural Committee. I, I had to wait until Marvin Jones, who was then chairman of the committee, went on the court before there was any opportunity that I could get on. There was a big demand for the Agricultural Committee. I, we had a pre-organization meeting this morning over in the House Agricultural Committee. We're going to have 16 new members. Uh, that's almost half of our total membership. And, as you say, uh, most of those fellows made no effort to get on. They were simply placed on the committee by the Ways and Means Committee. And that is but a reflection of the public attitude. Uh, I think the public isn't taking the interest in agriculture that they were 30 years ago. And uh, that, in turn, I think stems from the fact that our public has as I see it, pretty well decided that American farmers are going to feed them, come what may, and that they don't need to be bothered about agriculture, and that farmers are a small part of our population, so why be concerned? Uh, the fact that farmers are a small part of our population but proves, as I see it, I, the success of American agriculture uh, back uh, when George Washington was president of these United States, it took about three people in the country to feed one man in town, and you simply couldn't build big cities. Today, about one man in the country can feed probably something like 40 in town. Uh, mm -hmm. I, there's a tremendous increase in the ability of uh, individual farmers to feed the people in town. That has grown out of, as I see it, uh, the use of modern techniques. Uh, the farmer is more productive, each individual, by far, than he ever was. Don't you think, Congressman, that, that sometimes uh, our friends in the, uh, in the cities, and, the, and they are our friends, why, they don't realize the enormous advantage that this country uh, derives from the fact that we're able to feed our population with a rather small uh, percentage of our labor. I think the last figures I saw were that uh, about 6% right. of the American people make their living uh, in agriculture, that is, they're, they're in full-time uh, farming, and that, that those 6% uh, feed the other 94% of us better than uh, people are fed anywhere else in the world. 
Now that, in my judgment, gives us an enormous uh, asset in a world where uh, most of the people don't have enough to eat. Well, of course, and people don't realize that we couldn't have big cities were it not for that fact. Suppose it took three people in the country to feed one man in town, as it did 200 years ago. Suppose it took that now. You couldn't have two million people here in Washington and its environs. You couldn't have uh, great cities like New York and Chicago. They couldn't exist because they couldn't be enough people in the country to provide the food for them. The only way in the world you can have these big cities is to have a productive agriculture. Now, uh, this productive agriculture isn't simply the result of the fact that these people are working harder and longer. They're not working uh, longer. They're actually working less time. Even you and I probably worked longer when we were boys than most of them are doing now. But they're using a great many inputs in agriculture that Science has developed, They've, uh, we're using common phrases, we're using fertilizer, insecticides, and we're using motive power. All of those things that expands one man's uh, ability, it lengthens his arm, it uh, strengthens him. But you can't use those inputs into agriculture unless you've got the money to pay for them, because they're all terribly expensive. Uh, fertilizer is a good investment, we all know it. But uh, if you haven't got the original money to pay for the fertilizer, you're not going to make the investment. Uh, we all know that in most cases, uh, some kind of uh, mechanical uh, power is a good investment. But you're not going to use it unless you've got the uh, capital or can borrow the capital to buy it. Most of us know out in your country and mine that, uh, that water is a good investment. Uh, but uh, I've got a farm with, uh, and I've got four wells on it. But I don't pump them there all the time, because uh, unless I can get a pretty good price for my products, it don't pay me to pump those wells. And I've got to, got to figure that I'm going to get back something more than the cost that I put into pumping those wells. And that's true with every segment of agriculture, as I see it, unless farmers can get a 20th century price for what they're growing. They can't use 20th century methods of production. And if they're going to use 19th century methods of production, then our food production and our fiber production is bound to fall. Our people in our cities are bound to be thrown back on a antiquated living standard that's not as high as we would like to see them have. I think that you've simply got to pay enough. That the people of the world have got to pay enough mm -hmm. to uh, the producers of agricultural products mm -hmm. to enable them to get and use this modern techniques. Congressman Pogue, uh, along that line, it's always uh, struck me as a little bit odd that people think nothing of paying two, three, or four times as much for an automobile today as we did, let us say, uh, at the beginning of World War II, or during World War II. And yet, if there's any increase at all uh, in the price of uh, wheat, or corn, or dairy products, or the things that the uh, farmers uh, produce, uh, we hear all kinds of talk about inflation and about the uh, rise in, uh, in farm prices, as though it's somehow a kind of an odd uh, phenomena uh, for farm prices to go up a little when everything else is going uh, going up. I, I think that uh, we saw that experience here a year, a year and a half ago when farm prices firmed up a little bit, not very much, but there was a, there was a substantial uh, increase or a noticeable increase in some of our farm commodities. And immediately a good many people started talking about buyer strikes and talking about inflationary pre uh, pressures uh, in agriculture, and there were all kinds of dire predictions about what was going to happen if we didn't hold down the, the prices uh, of agriculture. Or as I gather, the, the thrust of what you're saying is that the farmer hasn't had his fair share well, of, of the national not. income. Of course not. You take wheat. It's selling for less today than it did 17 years ago. It's selling for less, I said. You got $2.25 a bushel some 17 years ago for wheat, and even with all of the government payments, you're averaging out about a uh, dollar and eighty to a dollar and eighty-five cents a bushel this year on, or last year on wheat. And without the, and with the government payments 
not covering a large part of the crop this coming year is going to be even less. And yet, now, uh, that, that's less than we got 17 years ago. And yet the price of bread is twice as high as it was. Well, not only the price of bread, but the, the price of the tractor, the, the price of the combine, uh, the, the price of the, uh, the chemical fertilizers, uh, the, uh, the price of labor, uh, virtually all of the costs that go into the production of that wheat have been moving uh, steadily up. At the same time, as you point out, wheat prices have not yet reached the level where they were 20 years ago. And cotton's not selling for as much as it was, even with the government payments. Now, there's a nine and a half cent payment, at least on part of the cotton you grow. It's not on all of it, by any manner means, as some people think, but on part of it. But even with that, cotton is not bringing within seven cents of what it brought 15 years ago. Congressman Fogg, if I, if I can uh, take you to another uh, uh, aspect of this uh, problem, you've just come back from a rather careful look at the uh, food and agriculture uh, uh, situation over in India. I think we all recognize that uh, what happens in India is of tremendous uh, importance, not only to us, but to people all over the world. It's sometimes said that the, the really uh, crucial uh, contest in Asia today is the question of whether the people are going to go the red China way or whether they're going to go the India way. Are they going to develop along a peaceful democratic uh, lines as we hope India will or will we see a, a kind of a violent uh, dictatorial uh, system uh, develop there that will get the support of most of the people of that great uh, continent. I think uh, it'd be interesting to a good many people to know what uh, you feel are some of the uh, the basic problems that face uh, India. Why, for example, uh, has their industrial and economic development lagged so far behind that of uh, some of the countries uh, in the West? What do you see as some of the problems that are holding back that uh, country? And what kind of a challenge does that present uh, not only to them, uh, but to us? Well, George, I think that, uh, of course, we've all got to take into consideration the problems that we all know exist even though we can't do anything about them like the cow problem in India. Yeah. I don't think we're going to solve that. That's something the people of India have got to solve. They've got 225 million head of cattle over there. <laughs> We've got less than half that amount in the United States. I don't think they get 40 percent efficiency out of those cattle. I mean by that that they don't get 40 percent of the benefit that they should out of them because most of the people of India won't eat them. <laughs> uh, most of the people of India will starve rather than eat uh, a cow that they think might be grandma or uh, some other dear relative, uh, and uh, uh, you can understand their feeling there, and I don't think we can change that. Mm -hmm. That's a burden that they've got to carry for a long time to come. I think they will change it ultimately, but uh, it'll take a long time. Basically, as I see it, their problem, of course, right at the moment, uh, their problem is the same as that that so often afflicts South Dakota and Texas, and that is drought. They've got in parts of India, certainly up in the Ganges Valley, where some of their finest land is, they've got a very severe two-year drought. They're on the second year of a terrible drought. I visited some of that area, and uh, I claim that if I'm an expert in anything, it is in dry weather, because I lived in that kind of a country. And we, we know a little <laughs> bit about we're that We're both, South we're both Dakota. pretty well versed on that, and I think that they've got a bad drought going on in part of the country. There are 28 million people in Bihar state alone. Those Indian states have got more people in them than most of the countries of the world. They are suffering. Let's recognize that. But there are large parts of India where there's no drought. We visited in South India where can, the physical conditions are good uh, and their crops are good. I, but India has tried to do one thing that I think most of the developing nations have tried, and you're lots more familiar with developing nations than I am. You were down in Brazil long enough to see what was happening down there. Maybe they didn't do it as badly as I think India is. Mm -hmm. But India is trying to develop, trying to move full scale into the mainstream of the 20th century, skipping the uh, foundation work that has to be done. They hope to build steel mills. They hope to build automobile factories. They are building them. They are doing these things uh, without laying the foundation. Now, I'm convinced that no nation on earth, unless they happen to be so favored, uh, like Kuwait with their oil production, 
ordinarily no nation on earth can build a firm industrial base until they have assured their agricultural base. In other words, the nation's got to be able to feed its people before it can put them into industry. Of course, industry alone won't feed the people. I, I've always thought that if there's any one lesson any economic lesson that our country uh, has to teach to the world, it's that very point. Well, we began with uh, leaders 175 years ago that really believed that the, the foundation of our society was the small farmer, yes. the small landholder. I think it was Jefferson that said the small landholder is the most precious part of the state. And he fully believed that until you had a strong a uh, healthy and well-established uh, agricultural base, you did not have a sound foundation on which either a, a democratic uh, political society uh, could be built or a sound economy. But as you say, I think some of these countries have thought that they could jump over that stage they of the development. Have. As a matter of fact, that they could uh, exploit the producers of food and take their savings, take away their, their profits, keep the price of food down, pull out the uh, resources of, uh, of an already neglected agriculture and put that capital into building fancy highways and factories and, and uh, all kinds of sophisticated uh, industrial development. And India's doing that right now. Isn't it true, though, uh, uh, Congressman Polk, that they have begun to uh, take a more oh, realistic I, I attitude certainly think the last, so. uh, last couple of years? I, I was in India seven years ago, and I had not been back there. I think I can see decided change for the better in their attitude. Uh, I think they are beginning through hard experience to recognize that they've got to uh, build a stronger agriculture and rely more on themselves. I think there were some Indians who uh, got the idea, and there's some who still have the idea, that uh, the United States will feed them. That's one of the weaknesses of our program. I, I think we do a world of good uh, in trying to help people, and I believe, as you do, that we ought to help people who need help. But uh, we've got to be very careful about letting people get the idea that uh, we're going to take them to raise them, as uh, we would say down home. Uh, we, can't, we can't feed India or any other country permanently. Uh, we better feed ourselves. We can do that at a reasonable price level, but uh, we can't feed the world and neither can any other country. The people have got to feed themselves at home. India has done exactly what you suggest there, and I know other countries have done the same thing. They have sought to lower the price of food products because their people wanted to buy food products, and they say, well, we're helping the man in the city. We're helping the masses of the people by keeping the price of wheat low. Uh, let's raise the price of cotton. We'll export cotton, and we'll therefore raise the price of cotton uh, because we want somebody else to buy it and pay us a lot of money. Now, that's fine if you could if you could get that somebody else to pay you more for that cotton, but he's not going to pay you anything more in the world market anyhow. And that uh, wheat, when you try to depress the price of wheat to that Indian farmer or any other farmer, he's just not going to grow wheat. He's going to go grow the thing you don't want. I where you let the price go up, and he's not going to grow the thing you do want. Or if he does grow it, he's going to hoard it for his own use and not put it on the market because uh, it won't pay him a profit. Now, the Indians are going to have to pay more for wheat at home, and they're going to have to pay less for cotton. I think they'd do well to be buying more cotton and, and growing more wheat. Uh, do you know that the India is planting 20 million acres of land in cotton did last year. That's approximately twice what the United States planted. But they didn't grow. They didn't grow a fifth as much per acre as we grow. They grew less than 100 pounds per acre. We grew 525 pounds per acre. Mm -hmm. well, I think, Bob, well, uh, uh, I'd certainly agree with you that they've, they've got some enormous uh, problems, and they have probably put the uh, emphasis wrong at various uh, times. Uh, it's really quite encouraging to take a look at the priority that they've given in their current uh, five-year plan to agriculture. At least I was glad to see agriculture right at the uh, top of the list. Oh, I am too. Of course, I hope they'll, uh, they'll follow through on that. And uh, I quite agree with you that we want to use our, 
uh, food for peace program or the food for freedom program, we want to use that in such a way that instead of discouraging uh, rural development in these uh, emerging uh, countries, we want to use that as a catalyst to, in a sense, to prime the pump, uh, to give them more energy and uh, more initiative to help themselves. And I, I think uh, uh, through the, uh, the leadership that you and others uh, provided in the Congress that we've drafted that new uh, Food for Peace program in such a way that it has a greater emphasis on, uh, on self-help uh, and should uh, uh, move us uh, in that uh, direction. That's what we've tried to do, and we've tried to do one more thing in connection with India and in connection with any other country that's uh, seeking large amounts of help. Uh, we felt, and I'm sure you agree, that, uh, that uh, the United States should not alone assume all of this burden, that other nations in the world should assume it. Uh, for that reason, the little group that went over there this fall, our winter recommended that uh, we should call or India should call upon other nations for uh, assistance comparable to that which the United States was giving and that uh, we should uh, be in the position of being willing to match what we suggested that we'd be willing to match what all the rest of the world together would do. Uh, let the Soviet Union show her good faith. Uh, let West Germany show her good faith. Uh, let Japan, Canada, other nations show their good faith. Canada has put up a million yes. tons of wheat. I don't want to suggest that uh, these people have been entirely lacking, but that whatever they would do, that we would do as much as all the rest of the world. Now, it seems to me that that's a rather generous position to take. Uh, and if we don't take some such position as that, the Indians are just like other people. They'll go to the place where they think they can make a soft touch, and uh, we're it. But if we say why we will match, and I see nothing wrong in that. Uh, uh, I've seen many a campaign in the church and in the college worked on exactly the same basis. Some fellows say why we'll build a new church here. And uh, I'll put up 25% of all the money. Uh, some wealthy man say that. Well, now, that's not a harsh attitude to take. That's, a, that's an enlightened attitude. It's an attitude that will get more help for the needed cause. And we think that will get more help for India to take that kind of basis than mm. to simply say, well, the United States is not going to bother about what anybody else is going to do. I think we've got to consider what other people will do. Well, I think that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, observation and, uh, and one that certainly uh, uh, requires some careful uh, thought and, and planning here. Uh, Bob, if I could uh, take you to just one more uh, uh, subject area here. We've got a few minutes uh, yeah. left. I was uh, uh, visiting with the editor of the Washington Post here the other day about an interesting view that he has on the relationship of our own uh, agricultural problem uh, to the problem of our cities. And he made the, uh, the observation that uh, one of the major problems in the great cities of the United States, and I suppose this is true in cities all over the world, is just the sheer problem of congestion. The, the strain on the, on the roads, the, the traffic uh, tie-ups, the, the strain on recreational facilities, the jam up in, uh, in housing, the, the pressure on all of the resources in our cities. And he said in his judgment, a good part of that has been brought on because over the last uh, 20 years, we haven't made agricultural life attractive enough and profitable enough to hold our young people on the farms and in the rural areas. So he said, in a sense, the squeezing out of uh, people uh, from our rural areas, from our rural states, the, the lack of, uh, of economic opportunities for farm people, particularly for young people that want to go into agriculture, and the, the, uh, literally the forcing of those people into the great cities of this country is really a double problem. Agriculture, the agricultural problem not only, not only hits the rural states, but the spillover into the cities is complicating uh, their problems. I'm wondering how you... Well, I think the problem that. of the cities is even greater than that of the rural areas mm -hmm. in regard to this uh, failure to provide an adequate uh, standard of living for rural people. Rural people right today are earning an income, and that's including the big farmers as well as the little ones, are earning an income of not much more than half or almost 
two-thirds, or I guess it's, what, 60 percent, uh, as much as urban people are earning. The average over the United States. Well, now, obviously, a very few of these people are going to be satisfied to uh, live out at the forks of the creek and earn uh, two-thirds as much as uh, their city cousins are earning. The result is they move to town. I, the rural areas lose uh, their skills and their training and their education. And those that were making a failure in the country move to town because uh, in town it's easier to get on the relief roll than it is uh, in the rural areas. And uh, they come to town and whether they get on the relief rolls or whether they don't, they increase the relief rolls of the city because uh, if I move in from the country and uh, you've got a job in town and I come in and I offer to work a little less or uh, some other way I get the job and put you on the relief roll, it costs the city just as much as it does if they put me on. So it makes no difference to the city who goes on the relief roll. The numbers go on there anyhow. And, uh, you know, I think that we could learn a lesson from India on that. I observed in India that these people, even in the drought area, uh, to get this grain that we're sending over there, they have to pay for it. They have to pay enough in Indian currency to pay the cost of that grain uh, delivered and transported and distributed. Uh, the only way in the world they can get that money is through public works. But they do public works. They don't hand anybody money. But uh, we saw them putting thousands of people working, building big, big levees, big enough to drive a car down, building them by hand, scooping out the dirt, carrying it in a little basket, dumping it up here. You'd think they'd never get anything done, but they did. Now, they all worked for it. That's something we don't do. If we required everybody who got on relief to work, we'd cut our relief rolls half in two, I think. <laughs> well, Bob, I think our, our time is just about uh, uh, expired. I want to say it's been a, a pleasure to share this uh, half hour uh, with you. And I look forward to working with you here in the Congress to see what uh, we can do, although we're somewhat outnumbered uh, by our uh, city brothers uh, to uh, strengthen the cause of American agriculture. Thank you, George. It's a pleasure to be with you. U.S. Farm Report has been brought to you as a public service in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. We wish to thank our special guests on today's show, United States Senator George McGovern of South Dakota and Chairman W.R. Pogue of the House Agriculture Committee. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week for more facts on agriculture, the economic gear wheel in our economy that produces most of our nation's new wealth.